Put myself here. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Welcome to today's panel discussion on the social and technological aspects of online age verification. We are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University's fourth space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. Here at Four Space, if you're new to us, welcome once again. We collaborate with our university community in order to activate the research projects and ongoing conversations across the university by co-creating daily activities. So to that end, it's our pleasure to have collaborated with doctoral candidate in electrical and computer engineering, as far Deep, who organized today's event and will be moderating this session as well. Just a quick note about engagement. If you're in the space with us, uh, please do raise a hand so we can get a microphone, a handheld microphone to you if you'd like to speak and join in the conversation with a question or a comment towards the end. And if you're joining us via Zoom, uh, same rules of engagement as usual. If you'd like to raise a virtual hand, we'll be able to see you here and you'll be able to jump into the conversation or the chat is activated for you to use as well. Alrighty, so to get us stutter started, it's my pleasure to pass the floor to our moderator, Aspardi. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. Uh, welcome all. It's so good to see the audience in person also online. My name is Aspar. I am a doctoral candidate here in Concordia in electrical and computer engineering. I work about age verification, and that's what we are going to discuss today. And we are so privileged to have an English pool of panelists with us. So I'm going to start with the introduction. Uh, the introductions are obviously quite long because all of them have accomplished so much in life. So I think it's still difficult to tell that in short. So firstly, we would like to welcome Senator Julie Mibel Dishen. Senator Mibel Dishen was appointed to the Canadian Senate in June 2018. Prior to that, she had a very colorful career in public service. She worked for Radio Canada for over 25 years as a reporter and foreign correspondent. In 2007, she became the first woman ombudsman for Radio Canada, which is a remarkable achievement. In 2011, she was named chair of the Quebec government's Council du Statue de la Femme. Since her appointment in the Senate, Senator Mivil Dishan has been actively promoting certain legislations to protect women kids all over across Canada. We can mention about Bill S211, which is a bill against forced labor and child labor supply chains. And importantly, Bill S210, which would record the implementation of age verification to protect minors from exposure to online pornography. I assume we are going to talk more about that today. Along with this, Senator Mibil Dishan is also Vice Chair of the Standing Senate Committee on Transport and Communication. She is also the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group to end modern slavery and human trafficking. Welcome, Senator. Our next panelist is MP Arnold Beerson. Mr. Wearson was elected as member of the House of Commons from Peace River Westlock in Alberta in 2015. As a member of the official opposition, Mr. Wearson has been passionate about protecting the rights of rural families, farms, industries in Alberta and all across Canada. He has been an active member in several parliamentary caucuses dealing with key issues. Particularly in March 2016, he introduced motion M47 which instructed the Health Committee in the House of Commons to examine the public health effects caused by the easy online accessibility of violent and degrading sexually explicit material impacting children, women, and men. On December 2016, this motion was unanimously adopted by the House of Commons. In 2018, Mr. Wearson launched the All-Party Parliamentary Group to end modern slavery and human trafficking, and he is serving as one of its four co-chairs. In May 2021, Mr. Wearson introduced the Stopping Internet Sexual Exploitation Act, or in abbreviation SISC, which records the verification of the age and consent of every person portrayed in the pornography material made for a commercial purpose prior to its creation and any distribution. Mr. Wearson was also involved in the mining study carried out very recently by the Standing Committee on Ethics in the House of Commons and he has been strongly advocating to implement all the 40 recommendations placed by that committee. In overall, Mr. Wilson has been continuously working across party lines, uniting all parliamentarians from all ends to raise awareness about the severe harm of pornography and companies that profit of exploitation and abuse. Welcome, Mr. Wilson. So uh, we are very delighted to have Senator Mivil Dishan and Mr. Wilson in person with us, and we are more delighted to have two more experts joining us online from the United States. So we have Dr. Nima Karimian, 
Dr. Nima Karimian is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at West Virginia University. Before joining there, he was an assistant professor in the Computer Engineering Department at San Jose University in the United States. Dr. Karimian obtained his PhD in Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Connecticut in 2018. <clears throat> Proud to that, he obtained his master's degree from University of Connecticut in 2016 and his bachelor's from the Babel Narshivani University of Technology in Iran in 2011. Dr. Karimian has been a pioneering researcher in certain areas of cybersecurity and biometrics. He has authored several journal publications and he has received several awards for his research work. His projects are sponsored by the National Science Foundation of the Federal Government of the US. He has also served as an organizing person for different ED events, particularly the Silicon Valley Cybersecurity Conference. Welcome, Dr. Karimia. We are glad to have you with us. Thank you. Our next panelist is Ms. Penny Rankin. So Penny Rankin, she is the past president of the Montreal Council of Women. So obviously, uh, she is from Montreal. Right now, she is in US. And we are very delighted that Penny, you could have the chance to join us right from there. She was also the VP with the Provincial Council of Women, PCQ, the PCWQ, as well as the chair responsible for children and youth with the National Council of Women of Canada. In spring 2022, her work on age verification was adopted as policy for the International Council of Women, consisting of 70 country members. In 2020, she co-founded Canadians for Action, an informal collective of NGOs and professionals from across Canada, dedicated to raise awareness and advocating for legislation directed at protecting children from online abuse and exploitation. She also sits on the sexual exploitation working group of the Canadian Council of Churches, and she serves as their spokesperson on human trafficking. Prior to this, Penny started her colorful career path in the United Kingdom, where she completed her studies in early childhood education. She worked for a significant time in marketing and advertising for some top-notch brands. Upon returning to Canada and also to teaching, she volunteered and with and has sat on several non-profit boards, including Le Ami Du Nero, as well as the serving as the executive director of an intern city mission. Welcome, Penny. So those were the introductions, and obviously uh, we could talk longer about all these panelists who all have been contributing so much in their own arena. And today they will enlighten us about age verification, particularly online age verification. So we're starting with Senator Vivil Dishan. So obviously, uh, Senator, you had a wonderful career serving the public sector as a journalist in different roles. And now as a senator, we find you very committed to this cause. You have been pioneering this legislation like Big Bill S210. So what makes you so engaged to this particular aspect? Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me uh, here today. So um, in a nutshell, I'm a feminist and I'm a mother and my children are young adults. So they were exposed to uh, porn as teenager to all this free porn. Um, because it started about 15 years ago. So I think it's es essential that children and teens <clears throat> be offered in school solid sexual education. You know, I believe in sexual education, but porn is everything except sexual education. It's a hardcore performance, often violent, women are dominated, <clears throat> and gender stereotypes are the norm. So before being a senator, I was also the head of the Council on the Status of Women in Quebec. Uh, this is a feminist research council advising the government. And I can also say that on those porn sites with a YouTube model, there is a real risk of absence of consent from women and of sexual exploitation of minors, kids, in uploaded videos. We've seen that in the news in the last years. On the viewer, the viewer side, kids who watch porn can be traumatized, but also according to experts, they are more at risk of becoming victims of online grooming by pedophiles because watching porn normalizes it. So porn is everywhere, you know it better than me. It occupies a quarter of world traffic on internet. Imagine a quarter. It could have a profound impact on equality between men and women. If your only model of sexuality is porn, it increases the risk of boys seeing women as objects and of girls wanting mainly to satisfy all the needs of boys, 
whatever they like themselves. As a feminist, I believe equality in both sexes in intimacy is absolutely crucial. I also believe, obviously, in protecting the innocence of children. Let them make their own discovery about sexuality in their own time without such models. The average age of first encounter with porn online is 11 years old. I repeat, 11 years old. Let's not forget, porn is supposed to be for adults only. In the real world, you have to have a proof of age when you buy a Playboy or go to a sex shop. On the internet, with a simple click, you can access millions and millions of hardcore videos without any age verification. So what I'm trying to do in Parliament is fairly easy to understand. The bill I'm proposing creates a criminal infraction for porn sites who won't verify the age of their customers. Since most websites are abroad, the bill also makes it possible with a court order to block from Canada porn sites who do not comply with the law. Blocking, you know, it's obviously big punishment. There is already a law to that effect in Germany, in France, and another one that's studied in the UK. It is a difficult battle. Porn sites are going to court to contest such laws. For them, it's a question of profits. All clicks count, even those of kids, because advertisement revenues are based on traffic. And age verification may also mean less adults who will want to submit to age verification to access porn sites. So, so these are my thoughts on your question. Thank you. Thank you so much for making this edition. Uh, so that's inspiring to know that uh, your commitment for the society has brought you this cause. And now we have the almost the same question from Mr. Beersin. So being a member in the House of Commons from Alberta, we saw you being engaged with so many different issues and particularly for protecting women and youth, and you have brought a number of legislations. So what actually makes you so committed for this cause? Oh, well, thanks, as far. Uh, <clears throat> but before I do that, I actually have to vote in the House of Commons. So I've actually taken the House of Commons along with me today. So there's actually a vote happening. So I'm just going to do that right now. Uh, <laughs> Isn't you, that great? They can do the new, that. This we is can't the new technology the here. So I'm voting nay on a, on a vote for uh, for time allocation. So the government wants a bill to pass quickly. So they're saying only with so many more hours. And so now I have to just take my photo here. And then uh, technology, it can uh, have good aspects. As you can see, in the Senate, we would love to have it too, but we don't. We have to be there to vote. So it takes two pictures of me authenticated submit vote. There you go, technology in action. I got six minutes left, so I'm, I'm okay. Super. Uh, what got me into this? Uh, that's, that's a big question, I guess. Um, so I'm an auto mechanic from Northern Alberta. I uh, got elected back in 2015. I, uh, I was selected for not, to be number 37 on the private members business. And so um, I, that was a, a luxury that I never really considered as uh, some members of parliament go their entire career and never get a private member's spot because it's kind of a lottery system to get it. So I was up early in my first parliament. Uh, some members of parliament get elected and they're like, they know exactly what their uh, private member's bill is going to be. I wasn't one of those. Uh, I didn't even know a thing called private member's bills existed um, before I got there. But I did know that there was things that I wanted to do when I got to parliament. So I'm a I'm currently the dad of uh, three, three daughters and, and two sons, and I want them to grow up in a, in a, a safe world. I want them to grow up to be uh, prosperous. I want them to grow up to have fulfilling lives. Um, and and uh, pornography is, is one of the challenges I see in, in the world. Um, my Christian faith definitely motivates me uh, in, this, in this for sure. But one of the stories that particularly impacted me was the story of Retea Parsons. Uh, I was a new dad. Uh, my firstborn daughter uh, was just a new new baby. And I remember listening to the CBC radio on my drive to work. And there was a story about this 14-year-old uh, girl who was raped at a party. That in itself, itself was a bad enough story. But what was like 
totally disturbing to me was the fact that the folks that had perpetrated this act thought this was so normal that they posted pictures of the event on their social media and were bragging about, about the fact. Now, I'm, I'm into 4 by 4 I, uh, I own a Jeep and I like to go off-road and things like that, and I take pictures of me doing that, and I post that on my Facebook page, and I think that that's, there, there's nothing immoral about what I'm doing there. Yet these boys were kind of doing the same thing, but with a rape scene. And that seemed to me like how, like it's, it's heinous what they've done, but how did they get it to the point where they thought it was so normal that they would post this as like, hey, look what we did on the weekend. And that, that brought me down this trajectory of, um, when I started on this, uh, I, I, I have a moral opposition to, to pornography because I think it, it's degradating to, uh, the human psyche. I think that there's a dignity that comes from humanity from us being created in the image of God. So that that's my motivation for being against pornography. But it wasn't the, the tangible imp, negative impacts of it aren't aren't necessary. That's how you start to take apart the Rutea Parson story, and that this rape scene was something that these boys had watched over and over and over again to the point where it was normal for them. To the point where it was like, hey, look what we did. We we've created our own porn scene, essentially, because that's what they're watching every day. So that's how, how I got into it. Um, Ritea Parsons, uh, several, three years after she was, that incident happened to her, she committed suicide. And so I, 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 the work that I do is kind of, I want to always recognize her as, and, and hope that the legacy that we can build around her name is, is one that tackles uh, this issue and, and makes us live in a society where uh, where all of humanity is valued, and and that it's this isn't a like a men versus women issue. This is a, a, a dignity of humanity um, issue, and that's really what motivates me. Uh, I've really tackled it from uh, the like age verification side, from this side of the screen, um, the the viewer side of the screen, as Senator Mavil Shane's bill has uh, is is doing. Um, but it's turned out there's a lot of more political appetite to work on it from the other side of the screen. And so I've introduced the, uh, the CSAC and that, that would mandate companies that are producing porn to verify, maintain records of the verification of the age of uh, the people that are perp or like portrayed in these videos. So both their age and consent must be verified in documentation. Um, it's- Because uh, it's not the case now. It's, it, you it, know, we don't verify all no all it would basically reverse the onus for the police so current currently if there's a if there's a case the police have to prove that she's underage they have to prove that she didn't consent to the to the images being up this would flip it around and the police can show up and just say where's your documentation if you don't have documentation uh, you're in violation of the criminal code uh so so that's kind of uh that's where where we've kind of gone with it those are kind of my motivations for it I think we need to ask is like, uh, what right do porn companies have to our kids? Uh, they don't, they don't have any right. And we should make sure that, uh, that our kids are protected online. So thanks, Asfar, for putting this together. And so uh, that's really enlightening for us. And now uh, we can go to the next question I took Dr. Karimian, uh, which is from a technological perspective. So obviously by now we all understand the crucial need of having age verification for the betterness of kids and youth. And Dr. Karimian, you have been a pioneering researcher working on these technologies. Uh, so me personally being an engineering student, me and others, we have been following your work a lot. And I guess just now we saw a very good example, thanks to MP Viersen, he voted in the House of Commons using digital identity. So I guess he was using his passport and his face, facial recognition. So those are the technologies we have, and that's what you actually work on, Dr. Karimian. So uh, what are your thoughts about the technological feasibility? Are we ready to have age verification enabled because it's a sensitive technology, and are we, can we foresee some good technologies coming up soon? All right, so uh, first of all, um, um, thanks for having me. My pleasure to be here um, to talk about the technology aspect of point of view. Um, so let's start off uh, why we do need age verification, how we can you know, use technology to use age verification. Perhaps you, you know, heard about some technologies such as a page recognition system, you know, fingerprint, and face recognition system is the most dominant technology it's been used for many applications. Uh, 
But overall, if you am going to categorize in terms of the biometrics, so it could be categorized in terms of the physiological signal, um, biological, in terms of the behavioral. So the behavior is like the way we type the um, you know keyboard, the way we top, type in the um, you know iPhone or any phone that you have, or the way we you know walk. So those are kind of the behavior where people start using that because it provides some continuous authentication. We can continuously monitor who is the person, who is a legitimate person trying to access the system. But also looking at other aspect is the physiological signal, which are face recognition system. So the face recognition system has been used for many, many years. There are a lot of um, you know, research has been done in, in order to improve the performance, improve the accuracy. Um, and however, when it comes to continuous authentication, let's say an example of that. Let's say you're trying to avoid your kids' access to certain kind of, you know, website, you know, pornography is website. Um, where they can do, where they can capture the person, you know, the, the family who are age above the a minor, and they can log into the system. But how we can ensure continuously monitor the same user using the phone, uh, where, you know, uh, we can access the system, right? So face recognition system, which is not going to provide that, you know, um, you know, capability for us. Even though it's 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 been used for face verification, we can use a face recognition system to identify whether your age group, either under 13, um, your minor or above that. So it's doable, but it is not going to be used for continuously monitoring the same user or going to access at a website. So how we can prevent that, how we can incorporate that, is better to use a continuous authentication system where we can continuously monitor the same user. So uh, what are the continuous biometric modality which has been used? One of them is a you know, behavioral biometric. Let's say your, your preference um, app or your you know, heart signal. So you can fool your heart signal and it can easily measure continuously and verify yourself through the website. And that provides not only identification, but also to provide a continuous authentication, whether the same user can access the website. But however, you have to see what are the technologies available. So it, is the you know, continuous authentication using the heart signal is available on the phone? Perhaps no, but it is available on, on your smartphone, let's say uh, Apple Watch. So, it's, so when you combine them with uh, face recognition system, so not only we're providing the you know user, um, you know we can verify the age of the user, but also we can verify that is the same user which is agree on the open of the access of the system. It's the same users be you know contacting the um, you know phone, and so. But however, looking at the technology, let's say I think I heard about in news two weeks ago, UT is a technology using the face recognition system to identify age. But the question is. If the system are robust or the system are fair enough or robust against all the type of the age, when, in terms of the demographic, in terms of ethnicity, we have to see whether the, whether the system are robust or not, because we're looking at the database available right now to investigate whether the face recognition is enough to identify the user um, through the age verification. There's not that much database. So there's not that much database that we can evaluate Hey, uh, with a different ethnicity, different you know genders, we can identify the age of the users. Um, so that's a limitation where people are trying to investigate based on the either generate the synthetic version of that because when it comes to the database, there are a lot of issue in terms of the ethical issue, privacy issue. So we're trying to do we're trying to synthesize the data on the different age. And you know, fit them to the system, let's say AI system, to identify of the age verification. But however, there's a problem with that. Either our synthetic data we're trying to generate are enough to robust enough to verify that this user or no? How our you know synthetic data is capable to identify a different age of the group? So that's a kind of the limitation. But also, when it comes to face recognition system, there are limitation aspect on the face recognition system, not only for the database, but also let's say if you have a skin infection, cosmetic makeup, diet, skin texture, change during the app holds, those gonna change your face shape, also change up the features 
that should be extracted from the face. Because when you're looking at the age verification, all, all, all of them are using the AI technology where we're trying to train the database for certain of the features where you can identify different age of the group. But however, when it comes to different aspect of the challenges associated with the face, let's say skin infection, you know, cosmetic makeup. So can we carry out this technology using those kind of limitation on the face? So those are the kind of the question has not been handled. So it should be handled, it should be investigated to make sure. Um, so we're considering all aspects of the different problem when it comes to technology aspect. So either we are going to continuously monitor the same user because when it comes to face, it's gonna be one user authentication, one-time authentication where just, you know, kids can, you know, take a picture of the other users and then log into the system and access the pornography websites. But how we can continuously monitor, monitor that? So we have to combine with some other technology, you know, including such as, um, you know, behavior of the biometric or some, you know, physiological, which is the heart signal, you know, you know, kids cannot, you know, fool their heart because it's continuously monitoring, continuously beeping, and we can monitor that uh, when it comes to combine with the facial recognition system. So again, so there are a lot of other technology in terms of the fingerprint. So even though the fingerprint requires some contact, but however, recent technology using the contactless fingerprint, we can take a picture of the fingerprint and then authenticate the users, and we can tell either a person is the above the age of 13 or not. So it is doable, but it's not limited to the face recognition system. So there are a lot of you know limitation of the face system. So if you're going to keep the data on the face on the, or relying the third party to identify the age verification, how we are going to make sure those data are going to be secure. So, you know, so those are kind of a challenging that need to be tackled uh, when it comes to technology as pack. So even though it's going to provide some conveniently, it's more relaxing compared to other, like say, password or documentation. But also it comes with some challenges in terms of how it can fool the system uh, or bypass the system. Absolutely. And, and if I can add something, um, because of all the challenges you've uh, talked about, uh, first of all, my bill doesn't choose any method. It will be left to the regulators because as we know, things uh, evolve quickly. But also to be frank, um, uh, artificial intelligence and um, face recognition is not part of this are not part of the solutions we are putting forward because they're extremely controversial um so we're we're less advanced but this is not the bill is not talking about it it will be left for later so so when so let me add it on top of that so let's say we are trying to identify the age of the user um, there are a couple of your in terms of the gathering the documentation or you know governmental id or you know the user by themselves are going to provide the age of that. So how we are going to ensure those are trustable? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't want to overtake. I will. Well, that's the whole challenge. Um, in my bill, I have I have an article saying that it has to be safe. It has to protect confidentiality. So once a bill is passed, generally there's about a year where experts, governments, and stakeholders are talking. And obviously, to make sure the technology is, is approved, um, it will probably be a third party and not the porn sites who will have, you know, there are third parties, specialized age verifiers who will be hired by porn sites or will work with porn sites, but they will be independent and they will have to show that their method is uh, is not invasive in terms of privacy. That's a great example. Um, so since I'm working with cybersecurity, we added on top of that kind of the problem that might be faced when it comes to third party, but also not the pornography, it might be the third party. Um, so there are a couple of the attack that can be integrated when there is a couple of the third party involving on the not only for age verification but also identity. So that could be manipulated by you know adversaries, 
or you know adversary can manipulate the documentation that are in in the database and on the third party so those are quite a bit challenging when it comes to cybersecurity type of attack on those because they can manipulate, let's say if the person are providing some documentation in terms of the um, you know, birth certificate, where indicating the age of that users. But however, those documentation, if the adversary could access to that, they can manipulate that. And then from there, you know, there's no any actual verifica age verification where we can trust on that, that we can rely on that. So again, so, that's a good example where the third party could be, you know, investigate or try to access those documentation, verify on behalf of other person. But however, there are a lot of challenges or associated with that need to be tackled, need to be addressed in, in the futures. Really quickly, Germany is doing it. Yes. They've approved some methods. It's working. Uh, it's it can be done. I just want us to be optimistic about it, and I will leave you ask your next question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karimian. Uh, it's very pretty exciting to know about these latest technologies, and thanks to Senator Mabel Dishan for uh, adding those points because we really need to have this conversation. Uh, we do have challenges technically or in other aspects, but uh, we need to see how we can overcome those. So so far we have talked about uh, legislations, law, technology. But at the core of all this, what we have is our society, the people for whom we are making these laws, we are bringing these technologies. And about that, uh, we assume Penny Rankin can really enlighten us. She has been a lifelong advocate, particularly about women's rights. Uh, so Penny, how do you find this issue, which is like our sort of more recent, maybe this is popping up for last one decade or so, but since you have been working with women's rights all around your life, so how do you look at this and how we can actually address this challenge? Uh, thank you, um, as far for inviting me, and uh, especially with such an extraordinary uh, panel. It's wonderful. Before I tell you how I actually feel, um, I think I too would like to talk about how I evolved into, into this particular subject. Um, as is true of uh, Senator Julie Maville de Chen and um, MP Beerson, I am a parent. Admittedly, my, my children are themselves old enough to be parents at this point, and I'm a feminist. Um, my own introduction to this particular issue evolved out of looking at the treatment of children living in refugee camps, mostly in Africa, but also in uh, the Middle East and Asia. And my, uh, my concern at the time and my focus at the time were traditional in that I was looking at issues around housing, access to education, health care family reunification, issues like that. But it didn't take long before the issue of human trafficking, you know, really meets you face to face when you're looking at, at situations, children living in these camps. And as I followed that thread, I then moved to looking at the human trafficking happening here in Canada. It wasn't all that big. Uh, a leap to you know look into your own backyard. What was shocking to me at the time was being a Montrealer um, that in my own backyard there was this monolith called Mind Geek, the home of Pornhub, and I had had no, I had no idea. Um, I was not aware really even of online harms. And, you know it may sound a bit pathetic um, at this point in time, but Concerns or conversations that were going on uh, through the early 90s uh, and into the early 2000s um, were conversations that really tended to focus more on children being uh, online uh, as just more screen time, an extension of the conversations you had about TV viewing. You know, what, what was it doing to their eyes? Why weren't they outside exercising and things like that? It was a very narrow view. And if you were to talk to me at that time about age verification, you know, frankly, even five, seven years ago, um, I, I would have probably leapt to or thought in terms of some form of ID confirmation so that a individual, a child could move to, you know, get the driver's license or buy beer. Um, admittedly, today, the public is much more digitally engaged. But 
that ignorance that I experienced is still happening today. There are many, many parents and communities who just really resist seemingly even to, to knowing about this. As to how I feel, and that was your direct question, um, what dominates is frustration, but I'm also hopeful. And what keeps me hopeful includes um, activities like today's event, um, raising awareness, and also the work and dedication of my fellow panelists who I have tremendous respect for. In terms of my own endeavors, um, the policy that was put forward by the National Council of Women of Canada that I drafted, it was adopted early, um, late last spring by the International Council. And this issue that we're talking about, uh, although the focus um, legislatively in, in this conversation is on what's happening in Canada, that this is an international issue. There's no way we're going to tackle it unless there is awareness and advocacy and action and legislation going on literally in every single country around the globe. Um, uh, incidentally, the, the, um, the policy that was adopted did focus on exposure to pornography, but also the other harms, much the same as what um, Senator, uh, MP um, Arnold Beerson was talking about in terms of how um, children and sextortion and things like that are happening. That particular policy um, was seconded by the National Council of Women of Great Britain. And they, like the National Council of Canada, um, have been active in advocating for protection legislation in the UK. And the UK itself is, of course, quite a few steps ahead of us, the French Council as well. In terms of a response that keeps me hopeful, um, so far, the only report that I have had has come back from South Africa. Um, where the council there is behind supporting the um, the country's actions to address this issue. And they, not unlike um, what um, Senator Julie um, Melville de just mentioned, are also looking into some of the things that are happening in Germany. Um, I think we all know that age verification in and of itself is not going to solve all the problems, least of all the demand that drives the problems. But uh, in Germany... When an individual buys a cell phone, a mobile, they would say there, um, they are sold. You have to prove that you are an adult before the the system is unlocked that would give you access to, um, well, not just to pornography, but anything that would normally be associated with adult uh, behavior. So each cell phone has a child lock of sorts on it. And that is something that I know that is being uh, looked at seriously by the South African government as we speak. So that makes me hopeful. Advocacy always involves patience. It takes time. It can take way too long, in fact. But, and challenges are always to be expected, but when it comes to protecting children and their well-being, it can be really frustrating, frustrating. and um, patience just needs to be flung out the door. But for me, protecting children from harm should be an absolute no-brainer. Age verification is not going to solve all the problems, but it will help. And it is frustrating to me that um, things cannot move more swiftly through our process. I mean, I have respect for the parliamentary process, but uh, having attended some of the um, meetings online um, where both um, your, our Canadian guests' um, bills have been brought forward. Listening to some of the testimony can be really upsetting um, in that it doesn't seem that anyone is seeking to prior prioritize children themselves. Um, one of the other elements, of course, is ignorance. Um, I've already alluded to my own in the past, and um, that is an issue. Uh, politically and even in the social fear, sphere, it doesn't really get that much traction, and I understand that. I mean, there's a lot of issues out there that we need to work on, whether we're talking when, when you're focusing on children, whether you're talking about clean water, access to health care, education, housing, homelessness, suicide prevention. Um, basically, until we prioritize the well-being of children, 
none of these concerns, whether we're talking about child poverty or protection online, none of these harms will be dealt with success successfully until we prioritize children's rights, which is one of the reasons that complementary or to, to, to one side of the work that I'm doing is pushing for Canada to um, not only meet its obligations in terms of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also to um, put into place a, a commission who's dedicated to children's rights, independent, um, and whatever the issue that that the that the impact of it will, or the or the trajectory of any bill that's going through the House will always be looked at also through the lens of of how it affects children today and the children of the future. We, we pretend that is what we do, but it's not actually what happens. If it was true then how can it be that Canada um, ranks 25th out of 41 countries in terms of the overall well-being of children? And we have terrible uh, um, statistics, um, not, not exclusively in relation to, for example, Indigenous children, uh, but you know we have a lot. So I'm frustrated by the procedural issues. Um, I'm exceedingly... Um, and the National Council itself um, engaged with the government, asking them why were we having to wait, um, having had protecting children online tied up in the whole conversation around hate speech. I have a, an understanding why for the complexities of dealing with hate speech online, but that has nothing to do with protecting children. There's no there's no valid reason not to have separated it out and just move forward on on this one issue so in a nutshell and i hope i'm not taking up too much time um too few people know that children have exactly the same rights as everyone else but we rarely prioritize them and um with that um if there are any questions or anything i'm open thank you Penny, uh, it's really ins inspiring to know about the other examples in other countries, and we are also playing a nice role to develop some global standard. So our next question is about the challenges. We already have touched a bit about different challenges, and maybe we can start with the bigger picture. So we are developing technologies, we are having laws, legislations. Uh, these are all for the kids. And as Penny was rightly saying, that uh, we need to be concerned about the real protection of the kids. We are, uh, unfortunately, right now, Canada is not in a very good ranking. So coming to that point, uh, maybe we can have things restricted. We can put the laws and legislation. We can have technology. But kids are curious. Kids or youth, they will always look for different options unless they are not provided the right educational scope. So we can start this part with uh, Penny again. Uh, if you can just share some highlights that how we can help to have the right education. Because blocking may be only one part of the solution, blocking or restriction, but we need to make sure that there are sufficient educational resources. So can you just talk a bit on that? Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. <laughs> um, right. So um, I don't believe that there's that any comprehensive education program for children and youth will be adopted and supported unless parents and society in general are themselves much more aware of the issues. So what we're really talking about there is investment in digital media literacy, uh, teaching healthy digi digital citizenship, um, and obviously online safety digital skills. I think this is going on in schools today. I mean, I know this is going on in schools today, but parents, family, and the general public need a lot more support in this area. And specifically around sex education, um, we cannot, I mean, Pornhub actually, um, uh, Senator Julie would pick this up on this one as well. They actually had their own site, which they honorably felt that they were supporting society by, by having this site that was, you know, all dedicated to healthy sex education. <laughs> there is absolutely no way that I want to hand over um, education around, um, and to use an important word that I heard um, Arnold use, dignity. These are 
these are <laughs> this is not something that that we should hand over to the adult entertainment industry nor even to the broader entertainment industry. This has to come from in the context of public health and in an education framework. And to me, um, you'd be delicate about how you, you frame these things, but it's um, because I don't want to come across as being moralistic or anything like that. Um, it's about relationship and respect, not only for each other, but for yourself as well. I mean, ideally, any kind of programming like that um, would be, you know, universal or nationwide. But in Canada, that gets tricky due to health and education being provincial responsibilities. And whatever we do going forward, I think it behooves us to definitely absolutely include youth and youth today into the conversation on how to best develop such a program. Um, you know, there are 8 million Canadian citizens who happen to be children and youth living in Canada. And yesterday, most people don't know this probably, but yesterday was National Child Day, World Children's Day, I think it's called in, um, internationally. And what I am going back to sort of my, my last points before is that each child has equal rights, exactly the same rights as any adult. And this includes the right to protection of harm and a decent education. We need to engage not only with parents and teacher, teaching staff and hockey coaches and you know anyone who's engaging with children and with the children themselves. Children have a legal right to good advice. They have a legal right to comprehensive, age-appropriate education on sex, because that's the only way that they can have a healthy, happy relationships in the future. And as Senator Julie pointed out, if we fail, or we continue actually to fail, because we are failing, I mean, that's the point. We're failing now. We're failing our children now, um, as evidenced by stories such as the one that um, sadly it has been repeated more than once, many, many, multiple times worldwide, where a, a young girl or boy has been raped, um, and it's been shared, and shared multiple, multiple times, which means multiple, multiple times that the victim is, is themselves re-victimized. Anyway, we've, we're failing our kids and we need to do something about it. And that programming, whatever form it takes, um, definitely has to begin even in, in preschool. That doesn't mean that you have to sit down with, you know, two, three and four year olds and, and talk about, um, uh, you know, the sexual act or intercourse or things like that. But it, you do start by talking to them about, um, you know, private being private. Um, Always remember that your body belongs to you. I'm reading this from um, uh, some something that came out of the UK, uh, that no means no. And also being able to talk about any secrets that upset you and to speak up to someone that can help. Um, it's a, a program that was developed in the UK that I think is quite helpful. I have a couple of links that at some point I will put into the chat line, but essentially um, I'm saying prioritize the children, push for this, support the bills that both these um, uh, parliamentarians are working on, and rattle some cages. We need to rattle some cages. It's very frustrating that, um, um, that this issue is not being itself being prioritized. And I compliment the work of all the experts around the table. My job is to raise awareness and push for action. And and I'm I am proud of that that the, the International Council is taking this on. They are they carry weight. They have um, uh, consultative status with the UN and in many with the um, International Labour Organization with UNICEF with um, UNESCO. So, so I mean, there, there's lots of opportunity there to to to, to rattle cages. And and I just one last point before I go, and that is our end. 
is that it was only in 2021, like this is how the world doesn't prioritize children. It was only in 2021, the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, that they finally included the, the, the rights of the child in the digital world. That was the first time the digital world was actually made part of, of the convention. And it's, it's vital that we, and in doing so, they, they were specific in naming the term, using the term age verification. They are calling for robust age veri verification, verification measures, excuse me, um, to be a part of um, each nation's signatories, nature, nation's um, legislation in terms of protecting the children online. So that's it for me. Hope that answered your question. Of course, thank you so much, Penny. So these are very good examples also, um, inspiring uh, stories that there has been some progress, especially regarding these alignment, cross-country alignment and other stuff. And on that note, maybe we can now ask Dr. Karimian that can we have similar alignment in the technical front? So we are having age verification related laws or there can be some global standard when different countries agree to step, make a certain standard. But when we talk about digital tech, this is a highly diverse thing. Uh, all over the world, we see different companies doing different business. So it's apparently difficult to bring everyone under one umbrella. And when we talk about cybersecurity, I think it's more challenging. So you already talk a bit about the challenges. And for edge verification, if we really want to have some foolproof solution, uh, we assume it's very important to have that alignment. So can you just share a bit about the challenges and how we can address those together? I think it is a very challenging question. If they say that um, we can prevent and there's no any security issue later on, if we design something and we come up with some solution, because um, if, if that is the case, we wouldn't see or heard about some news regarding the breaches right now. And there are a lot of effort on going on on cybersecurity to prevent some sort of the attack that happening on digital identity. But however, when we design that, it doesn't mean that are secure enough um, to prevent any type of attack that might face in the future. So let me example provided by biometric specifically. In the biometric specifically, we have a spoofing type of attack that the subjects are trying to um, access the legitimate user by bypassing the system, uh, providing some synthetic version of the uh, biometric data, such as, you know, fake sample of the face that we can impersonate the data. So those are quite a bit printed photo, display image, or the video, 3D mask, or kind of reverse engineering the face mask. And we could truly the sketch or we can do the makeup accessory, very, you know, a varying or public kind of the plastic surgery. We can have that to generate the synthetic version of those and we can manipulate that and then inject to the system for bypassing that. Um, so in terms of the category of the type of attack that can be applied to the face recognition system, again, on the, you know, photo attack, um, we can print that and then we can provide it on the on in the camera. But however, this is a very simple one. And it has been introduced perhaps, you know, six years ago. That was a simple kind of the attack that was introduced in the biometric community. And by that, before that, nobody thought that it might be doable to, you know, bypass the system by to those kind of the spoofing attack. Then they come up with some countermeasure to avoid those kind of the scenario. They can look at the depths of the features on the pixel and it can prevent that. Later on, they come up with some video user reply attack. They provide the video so they can not identify them. I mean, the system could not identify legitimate user versus the um, you know, adversary trying to access the system. And then after that, you know, 3D you know, mask attack has been introduced where, you know, you can create the 3D mask of the face of the user and bypass the system. And then now we can see the deep fake uh, where, you know, in advance of the AI, we can create the deep fake of the video. We can create that and then bypass the system. And this is the very tremendous type of attack that has been introduced by developing the AI. So even though AI is going to help to provide a better accuracy, better identity on the biometric technology, but also it's gonna provide the flexibility and advanced 
advanced technology to adversity to generate the deep fake of the sample of that. But there are a couple of the um, research on going on try to avoid of um, those type of attack. It's kind of the um, through the you know texture of the analysis based on the video. So we're looking at, for example, whether the genuine you know face is coming from the texture of that. So we're looking at the depths of the pixel provided by the user either through the face mask or is kind of the legitimate user. So those are could be trained. It should be trained on the system that we can distinguish between the fake sample versus the genuine samples. But also look at the hardware element. So we have to look at the hardware, whether through the thermal of the users or through the actual uh, near infrared. So those are technology will help us to identify whether we're going to facing on, on the you know, fake sample versus the legitimate samples or the, through the motion. So, you know, you have the eye tracking. So, so generally expect to have the blinking of the eye every two seconds. And you're expecting that legitimate user providing that particular, you know, emotion, you know, motion characteristic on the system. If not, then we can determine this is the fake sample. But however, when you look at the trade-off between the fake sample, I mean, the technology that we can prevent those type of attack versus kind of the attack is introduced every day, every single year. So kind of the parallel between the problem, you know, defense and an adversary. So they have kind of the getting advantage of the technology that we're using. And I'll meanwhile, we're trying to avoid that technology. But they're not limited to those kind of the attack. So another type of the attack is how we can securely keep those data on the system. So let's say we're trying to identify age of the user. We have to have some technology such as the face. We have to keep it on the system database. Later on, we're going to compare whether the same user, you know, let's say minor trying to log in the system, we're going to compare with the database and try to identify that users. But when you're going to keep the data, we have to make sure those are securely, you know, yeah, you know, securely embedded on the system. Otherwise, if the adversary could, you know, break that the system, they can identify not only identify the user legitimate, but also they can provide, you know, in kind of introduce this you know, privacy risk. And in privacy, that means if they could access that information, they can identify whether you have the health, what is your health status. We can see that right now, there are many technology using the face to generate the entire of the body of the person and then tell you whether you have diabetes or not, whether you have the heart disease or not. And if the adversary could access those information, it's gonna break your information about health status and they can sell it to the insurance company and insurance company either is gonna bump your insurance rate or is not gonna provide the insurance health coverage. So we have to securely Keep the information on the database. Nobody can break that. It's very hard, but also it's very it's very important to keep our um, information security. But when it comes to so again, so those are information all related to the face recognition system. But now technology, I said that you can identify, you know, oxygen level of the person through the face recognition system. So. By having that information combined the face recognition system, we can try to say that this is the live user. So we can, through the live sense detection, we can tell that this is the live user trying to access the system and we can verify the age of the user. Otherwise, we can say, this is the not live users. We're not going to, we're going to block to access to the certain device, even though it is, is actual, um, you know, legitimate user. So. So we have to have a two system, either we have to identify user through the face technology, but however, we have to prevent some of a spoofing attack or kind of the um, any type of attack that can prevent um, from legitimate access, adversity to access the legitimate user, but also through the live sense detection, we can make sure that user is legitimate and is live. It is not the fake sample trying to access the system. And also the last but not least, keeping the information securely. Otherwise, if those information is being released, no way that you can revoke your identity, no way you can replace your face, no way you can replace your fingerprint. It's been released and it's been, you know, um, um, you know, kind of the, um, there's no any reversible that you can kind of replace your identity using the face recognition or fingerprint 
on the system. So we have to be careful when we're going to implement that on the system. Karim here for providing a full view. Uh, the next question is for MP Veersen. So uh, we have talked about different challenges. Now coming to the legislative part, um, in Canada we have three layers of government. So far we are seeing great deal of work in the federal level, uh, but maybe we need similar support from the provincial government or maybe from the municipal governments. For instance, uh, when we talk about age verification, uh, the definition of minor, the minimum age, it also varies from province to province. And in some cases, maybe we need to talk about global collaboration because uh, not all the IT companies, they are hosted here. So can you highlight on that, how we can make that alignment in different layers of government or maybe beyond our border? Yeah, <clears throat> so generally the, the, like what's the political landscape looking like uh, for passing some of these things. Now it's interesting, uh, my initial motion on uh, the, having the government do a study on the impacts of pornography that I managed to pass it through the House of Commons unanimously. Uh, no, nobody was opposed to it. Uh, so there, there seems to be an appetite for this. Now, uh, one of my favorite politicians, he told me that, Arnold, you can't, sell, you can't sell a solution to a problem that nobody knows exists. And that's, that's the challenge that we are, we are facing, is, is that uh, the, the professional world, uh, the academic world is starting to see, uh, teachers are starting to see this as an issue. Uh, so the, the professional world and the parents are seeing this, but the general public isn't seeing this as an issue. And sometimes just part of that is our job is to highlight it as an issue. Now, I guess uh, I, I got kind of two stories on this. One is the story of the automobile and the highway. Um, we got to think about the internet as the information highway and think about the development of our traffic rules, for example. Uh, when the first guy built his first car, he just went out and drove it on the road along with the horse and buggy and things, things went awry. And then, then they were like, oh, you got to put red lights on the back, white lights on the front uh, so that people know whether you're coming or going. And that's, that got sorted out. And then we taught our kids to like, when they got to the edge of the road, to look both ways and cross. And then we put traffic lights up, all of this kind of stuff. And we put seat belts in and it, it developed over time. We got to think about the internet in similar fashion is, is that, uh, it, as it develops, uh, the regulatory regime develops. Nobody thinks that you're harnessing the, the, the road system and you're making the road system a, a, a harnessed place by putting in these rules so that we all stay safe on this, right? That's, that's what we got to do with, with the internet. We, and and uh, we, we, don't give kids, we don't give kids access to the road right away. We don't, we don't give them the keys to our car immediately, right? We, we let them grow up. We, we instruct them on how the road works. We instruct them on how vehicles work. And we give them a license when they're 16 that they got to sit beside their mom and dad and learn how to drive. And then when they're 18 or 21, they can drive a big rig, right? These are, these are all the things we deal with on the road. We got to we got to work on that when it comes to the internet as well. We got to ease people into it. Uh, the, the whole idea in Germany around the, the licensing or the like checking off your cell phone that you're of age and you get access to other parts of the internet. That, that seems like an appropriate way of managing it. The other part of it is uh, particularly uh, for the age verification around uh, pornography use or, or just pornography use in general um, is to just think about uh, cigarette use, for example. Uh, back in 1968, it was something like 80% of Canadians were using tobacco products. Today, it's down to 13%. Um, through, through regulatory measures, we have managed to make uh, smoking a totally normal thing to now uh, if if I meet a random smoker, I have no I just might have just met that person a minute ago, and I find out that they smoke. If I make fun of them for smoking, that th that is not a problem. It's not they're, they're smoking is such a social pariah in our in our culture that we can make fun of total strangers for smoking. Um, th that 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 is something that it, it's a culture change. It's something that we as a culture. Um, work on and and so a lot of it is like yes the legislative stuff I think it follows it, it, it pushes culture but then it also follows culture and uh, and so all of these things is you 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 go where you can go and if you run into a roadblock there's probably some other way around it um, but it also people will start to recognize that we need rules of the road uh, there are things that are appropriate for the road to be doing and the things that they're not 
Um, so just to conceptualize it in those two manners, I think, really helps think about how we're going to deal with this age verification and the, and the issues that we come up against. So, yeah, thanks as well. Bivirsen and uh, we think that example of spoken is a very good one. It shows that how our outlook changes with time. So something we are considering to do, it might really help in future in a different way for sure. And on that note, now we are asking again Senator Mibil Dishan about the legislative part. So you are almost uh, there to pass the bill S210. Congratulations for that. In the Senate. In the Senate. Because and it has to go through the House of Commons afterwards. It's ex not. Exactly. So that's the question is about that in the House of Commons, there is also we know about the online harm bill, which federal government is working about. And maybe these two can complement each other or they can be a, work in a broader context. So when we're talking about these bills, about digital space, there is also concerns from our certain perspective about the restriction of freedom, according to some, I mean, according to some particular point of view. So how do you look at that, like restriction or making some uh, barrier? Do you see in that way or you think that this can actually help us in the long run? So uh, if you um, permit me, I will just answer before to uh, Penny uh, Renkin. Thank you for being there. And she did ask questions about why is it so long? Um, my colleague Arnold Viersen was lucky in a way with, with your first uh, motion because it went quite fast. In my case, I've been at it for over two years uh, with this private member's bill. And I had to start over twice because there was an election. So. You know, making legislation is long, but it's even longer for a private member bill because we are the only one to support it and we have to go through all the steps and try to build consensus. If the government was interested and would take that particular duty, obviously things would go quicker. I'm not saying they would be, you know, it would go in a month, but we are doing stuff that takes time because we have to build consensus inside the parliament and outside the parliament. So as for um, the eventual online uh, uh, bill, online arms bill, it's not introduced yet. It's an idea of the government. But if I could just uh, quickly, because Arnold has done that brilliantly, uh, say myself too that it's the, one of the trap would be to think that on the internet, everything must be different. So some people argue that the rules in the real world should not apply in internet and they're really strong on on this freedom uh, because obviously they feel it's completely free but it's not true because we can we can think about online banking subject to the same rules that real world banking e-commerce is regulated much like real world commerce internet fraud <laughs> is prosecuted like real world fraud and children uh, cannot gamble, buy alcohol or consume porn in the real world. So they should not be able to do so online. This is why I sponsored S210, but it is true that uh, regulating this new world is difficult because it's a new world and different countries are trying different things. Um, there's also another trap completely at the opposite, which is to say that even though we have the internet, everything should remain the same. And as if the internet did not change a lot of things, and it does. And we sometimes hear these criticism these days, especially in the context of Bill C-11. And myself and my colleague Arnold Viersen do not see, do not have the same opinion on that. Uh, conservatives are calling it a censorship bill, which is not, but it's, you know, it's politics and we use words and we, we try to, to push our ideas. And the idea of Bill C-11 is to aim to protect and promote Canadian culture at the age of Netflix, Spotify and YouTube. A difficult, a challenging proposition when the public can watch and listen what it wants, when it wants. And we won't go back, we know. So how do you do that? That's pretty difficult. Um, so what does that mean for the broad feed of online harms? It means we should try to avoid both traps. Certainly some things do not change. We cannot defame, you cannot utter death threats in the real world, and you should not be able to do so online. You have freedom of expression in the real world, and you should have it online as well. But some things change as well. 
the internet is less safe than the real world world we interact with more people including millions of strangers and interactions are global and instantaneous so this bill the federal government is in the process of writing a bill on online harms it would be twofold from the different rumors and and meetings uh, to which i attended first the idea is to give responsibility to platforms online platforms to build what's called now security and age appropriateness by design to make it much more difficult for minors to access some content that could be detrimental for them. So they're really saying it's your job, the platforms, to do that. One other idea is, uh, the, is the creation of a new regulator apart from the CRTC. And this regulator would ask online websites to take down flagged harmful content in 24 hours and slapped heavy fines on platform if they don't. So obviously, I haven't seen the written bill. We don't know what's in it. And we will evaluate this bill when we see it. I'm sure you will, too. Yeah, yeah you I, I, just a little, if I can add just a little bit to that as well. One of the um, online harms bills, in the whole discussion of it, I just want to, again, conceptualize things a little bit. Often it's in the terms of, of material or content is what they're talking about with online harms. But we, we should also think about just um, is the actual programming, um, and, and maybe our, our friend Dr. Nima can talk to this a little bit as well, is the actual programming harmful? Uh, the, the only example I have that's really tangible is Twitter, uh, no, Instagram. It was Instagram. I don't, don't want to say the wrong I think it was Instagram, uh, they had a notification feature. Um, these companies hire the, the best brain scientists in the world and, and they, they are trying to make their product addictive. Um, so it's, it's not the content necessarily, it's, it was the notification feature that Instagram had put in place on the way that it, and they've discovered that it was just destroying the mental health of young girls. And they actually removed that, that notification yeah. feature. And it wasn't, it wasn't the content that was the problem. It was the way that they had built uh, this notification feature. Uh, so it's a good example. So it's Thank not, it, so sometimes we think about it in terms of material or content, but it's, sometimes it's actually just the build uh, of the actual application that is harmful. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's the difference between uh, is, uh, is is a, is a drug just straight up harmful or does it have like a, a good use somewhere and in, in is the context of that use um, that's it's a, a kind of a clunky analogy but I, I I'm getting some nodding of heads here so I'm, I'm explaining it reasonably well <laughs> no, no, I'm confident. You, you do and also it's an interesting to know that you know we're talking about age verification and and um, uh, facial recognition, but the, we were talking to Google and they were telling us they have so many ways of knowing if it's an under, underage, a minor who's on the platform, looking at their habits in terms of consumption, you know, they can do all kinds of things to try to avoid having minors on such and such programs. So they have the tools, they just have to use it. Yeah, it always scares me a little bit is that I transfer from multiple devices during the day and the device always seems to say hello Arnold when I show up, right? Like it's uh, regardless. No, no of, they know they know a lot. Yeah, too much. <laughs> so let me add a top of. Right. So yeah, the, the company yeah. trying add quickly to that. Maybe uh, we will go to audience questions soon. So maybe if you can add right. quickly to that. And just quick added. So what company trying to do? Trying to um, you know make a profit for themselves. So what they do is basically they're trying to identify users, but also look at their age as well, look at their ethnicity. Based on their system will be optimized when they're sending some adver um, you know, advertisement. So, so they don't want it to provide advertisement on a you know, regular age. So they're trying to target who are you, what is your favorite of the stuff when you log in the system. And based on your age, they're going to advertise and they send it to you. And Technically, what they, you know, figure out with the system is just looking at. So when you agree on their, you know, app, so they're asking, hey, we're going to access your 
um, voice. We're going to access your camera. We're going to access your contact number, which is not necessarily to be part of that, but you know, trying to make a profit based on that information. Um, so to make that you know program more compatible, more efficient um, in terms of the costly at the at their end, not at the user end. for our intent point. So uh, we have around 15 minutes left of our scheduled time. So maybe we can some, take some questions from the audience. Uh, we can start with those who are present in person and those who are joining us online, you're highly welcome to put your questions on the chat. So firstly, from the in-person audience, uh, anyone has any question for our panelists? So we are having an open conversation and you're highly welcome to share your opinion, your thoughts or any question for us. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much everyone for speaking today. Um, we talked a lot about uh, implementing age verification technology um, for users uh, and like how that would restrict access for minors. But my question is like, what is the connection then to the exploitative content and the like lack of consent? Like how does this type of legis legislation pose to resolve those issues? I'll be brief. There, there would be two different legislation. I'm taking it from the point of view of viewers, but knowing very well that when children look at porn, it can normalize pornography for them and they can be victim of pedophiles. So this is the link for exploitation. But on the other side, what's on the porn sites is a different matter. This has been more in the public eyes because of uh, the New York Times uh, investigation. We had flagged, Arnold Dearson in particular, had flagged it quite a few times before to the government. But um, in this case, you need more regulation for the platforms in the way they're doing business. I'm just asking the platform to verify age, but there's also all kinds of other things that are, you know, mind you, completely illegal. You can't show um, uh, sexual, exploitation, sexual exploitation of kids uh, on the internet. That's illegal. You can't show pictures of, of women who have not consented. Uh, so it's illegal, but obviously, you know, we have no charges yet um, uh, and many, many allegations. So on that matter, I think my colleague has another idea. Yeah, so I mentioned it <laughs> off the top there, the CS Act, uh, the Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act. Uh, th I've been putting that one forward. This is my second parliament I've put it in. Again, it takes time. Um, but yeah, like, like Senator said already, illegal, uh, illegal content includes uh, underage content and, uh, and non-consensual. Uh, the trouble is, is that the volume of illegal content is astronomical and the police are um, it seem to be immobilized into like which cases do we take on and so the extreme pre like infant um, pornography is is the ones that they go after uh, the the uh, pubescent images they, they strictly don't have the resources to tackle my this bill would just make it a the would flip the onus from the police having to prove the age and the consent of the individual depicted to the companies would have to prove that. Uh, that and that would make their life a lot easier. And if if you go to the police and say, hey, my image is up there and I never consented to this, the police can show up and say, okay, where's the documentation showing that this video, the people depicted in this video are consenting to this. Um, the bill also allows for uh, folks to revoke their consent. Um, so you may have at one point in your life consented to your image being up and today you don't want it up anymore. Uh, you can say, hey, I want to take that down. And that, the police can show up and say, hey, this person, here's the documentation showing that that person no longer consents. Uh, please take these videos down. And so that's, the hope is that that would um, clean up the act of some of these uh, organizations who, who are basically just saying like, hey, we don't know, we just put up stuff, right? Um, uh, there, this would have, say, would make a link um, between folks depicted in the videos and folks that are hosting the videos and say, hey, you, mu you must maintain the documentation. One, one of the challenges, if I may in, um, inter interject, um, is that, I mean, obviously there are concerns in terms of enforcement, but so much of the activity that goes on 
uh, in terms of cyber sex abuse of children. The children themselves are not necessarily in Canada. In fact, the vast majority of them tend to be in either the Philippines or Cambodia when you're talking about um, cyber sex abuse. And then you come into huge issues in terms of jurisdictions. How do you prosecute when the victim is in one country and the perpetrator who's directing online abuse as though they're creating a little film for themselves? Um, um, th th this is a huge problem as well. And Interpol has, has um, recognized that Canadians, Germans and Americans are predominantly those who um, are the most um, active in terms of cyber sex abuse of children in the Philippines, for example. And the reason it's the Philippines, it has to do with language and it also has to do with the fact that there are so many, um, um, what do you call them, uh, call centers. And um, there is quite an excellent um, network in terms of the internet um, in the Philippines. And traditionally, that was one of the countries, or still is, I presume, to a certain extent, uh, a destination for the, for those who are for pedophiles, basically. So, if I could answer quickly uh, to Mrs. Remkin, um, you're absolutely right. If I can uh, shed a little hope, um, I was visiting the RCMP center um, in the suburbs of Ottawa, where they're trying to find uh, those abuses on the internet and uh, was told that there is quite a lot of collaboration between uh, police forces around the world. And even the RCMP was posting one of their um, agent in Southeast Asia. I think it was the Philippines, but I'm not absolutely sure because what you're talking about is exactly that. So no, it's not perfect. Yes, you're right about extraterritoriality. It's a real challenge. That's why on my bill in particular, sorry, for my bill in particular on age verification, we had to find a path to be able to, to, to go to those international uh, porn sites. And the path is you can block the website in Canada because yes. we have internet service provider who can just pull the plug if a court tells them to do it. So even though this company is abroad, you can have some uh, some control by, you know, in the end, blocking the website. And if many countries do it, at the end, those websites, who are obviously do not want to comply because it means losing money, could well decide that to survive, they will comply. But it takes a critical mass of countries doing the same thing. Which is why I have exactly the same um, element in the policy that went to the ICW, so encouraging countries to also um, put into place, um, you know, sim similar um, points in terms of pulling the plug. I just want to just share one little piece of information that um, might shock you. In, in 2019, um, Pornhub issued their annual report. And at the, one of the things they were celebrating was that they said that were you to begin watching online pornography, not all of it necessarily non-consensual or with children, but just think of the, 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 the product. And you started in 1859, I think it was, that, and you wanted to watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week and you never wanted to watch the same um, film over again, you would still be watching in 2019. The sheer volume of what we're talking about is just mind boggling. I mean, I can't grasp that, but it's in their annual report and, and you can look at it. And it's, it's, it, this, is, this is what we're up against, it, this is huge. And police forces, Interpol, RCMP, uh, Americans, I mean, everybody around the world really needs to get behind this. And it's tough work. I, I've talked, spent time talking also with the RCMP. They have to recycle people in and out of that um, department because of trauma. Yep. You know, this is really, really hard stuff, particularly since they are focusing on young children. And we're talking about newborns sometimes. This is really 
ugly. And um, anyway, so there you go. That's what I found in my backyard when I first started looking at human trafficking. And that's why today I continue the work that I'm doing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for adding to the points and thanks, Becca, for the question. So we have one question from our online audience from Claire Adamson. So uh, the question is, could movie classifiers be hard for internet and have PG rated content blocked uh, until unblocked by an adult? So uh, I assume the question is about should we have any particular people or a group do their ratings and based on that, can we make some further restrictions? So anyone wants to try that? Well, briefly, um, the idea of the bill uh, I'm sponsoring is exactly that. You know, if you would, if if a child wants to go uh, on the, on the porn site, they would be blocked until age verifier have ensure that this this citizen, this person, is over eighteen, and generally the only information that the porn site would get is that this uh, particular uh, person is over 18 they would not get their name or any of their information that's the way it works um movie classifier the the the, the difficulty i would say is when you start to separate you know in, in porn there's everything there's violence there's hardcore there's so you know the idea of classifying as it is done in the real world is a bit you know, as, as Penny was saying, there's, the volume is just too big and it's a subjective exercise. So let's not go there. Let, let's at least in the first, you know, as a first step, protect the, the children and the under 18, I would say. Yeah, and I, the, I guess one of the other things is like, I try not to be just like too prescriptive in what the technology is. Uh, the law is, is that you can't provide it's illegal to provide pornography to underage children. Um, we should just be enforcing that and companies should be working to make sure that their products not landing up in the, ends, in the hands of kids. The same way that we do at the corner store, the cigarettes don't end up in the, in the hands of kids. The, the alcohol doesn't hand, land in the hands of kids. And companies that are, that are not monitoring that and are, and are selling booze to underage kids or selling cigarettes to un, underage kids, they are, penalized for that and it's like complaint based like some mom says hey this guy sold sold my kid cigarettes uh, there's there's that but then there's like the, the undercover or like the where people go in and uh, dressed up as an underage person and try to buy cigarettes and and they people get caught uh, those that's another mechanism um, these companies have the the intel they they're the experts of the internet the mind geek mind geek is always bragging about how they know everything about everything and if you had an internet problem they would be able to fi fix it um all right guys keep your stuff out of the hands of kids uh, i don't care how you do that just do that right and if your if your stuff's landing up in the hands of kids and some parents complaining about it you're going to be fine if your stuff's ending up in the hands of kids because somebody's imitated the kid and, and test your system and it's not working, you're going to get, you're going to find or held accountable. That's, that's the world that we're pursuing. And, and it's not going to be a hundred percent efficient. You know, no law is absolutely efficient. And this one would not be it either uh, in the sense that any child or any, I would say, teen could use a VPN uh, to hide where their, um, uh, their, their place of living. And so they would not be caught by age verification. So that happens, but it's not because the system can be circumvented that you don't establish laws. Laws are there to, first of all, there's a signal that it's illegal. And then for most children who don't have a VPN, who, who stumble on porn by, by, by chance sometimes, it would make a difference. Uh, what we all get from here is that it's important to start first. So we have to start from somewhere. So we have one more question and yeah, we also have a couple of minutes left. So sure, yeah. 
So, okay. Yes, that's good. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, I guess my question is surrounding putting the onus on companies like MindGeek to perform age verification. If we can agree that MindGeek um, perpetuates harm against minors um, and that the collection of biometric data is also incredibly sensitive and can create harm, how do we? How are we positioning this idea that then um, MindGeek is responsible for creating these mechanisms firstly. And secondly, I don't think that this, you know, comparison to, for example, smoking is a perfect one-to-one -one mapping because in this example, the Philip Morris Corporation is not, you know, being responsible for ensuring that minors don't consume tobacco. Exactly. But so in, in that case, it's, it's obviously a big, big concern and you're absolutely right. Porn site would not do age verification, never. They would have to hire and pay for third party independent companies whose specialty is age verification. And this company would have to be approved because when you say we don't care how it's done, yes, we do. We care because we don't want this information to be uh, in the hands of, of Pornhub or MindKey. So obviously it's a little bit of bureaucracy, but the third party uh, companies would have to be uh, approved by the government. So they would have to be you know, above, uh, above, you know, they would have to respect privacy to do that with minimal intervention, there would be all criterias to respect. This mm -hmm. is the way it's, it's working in Germany, and it's working. So, but absolutely, the less information uh, the porn sites have on kids and adults and everybody, uh, the better. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, just add it up here in the US, any company, any biometric company were trying to release their product so they have to be verified by NIST National Institute um, um, standard where they're going to be independent and they're going to verify the system in terms of the how they're going to keep the privacy user how they can securely keep the data or what is the performance of the data you know not based on the database they have but also the database that NIST have which are going to be evaluated independently make sure they have all the standard before releasing them to the public, so. Yeah, I, just to jump back to your question there a little bit uh, and the, the cigarette company comparison, uh, MindGeek is much like your corner store. Um, they're generally not the content creators. They are, they are tab correlating the, the content and putting it out to the, to the marketplace. And so that, um, yeah, the corner store operator is the one that gets in trouble when they're selling cigarettes to, to kids. Uh, in the same way, I think that uh, like the, Porn hubs of the world should be the ones that are like responsible for if if people get caught in their store. Um, that that's the that's one one element of it for sure. The other piece, th this is why this whole like inner like uh, information highway, um, the UK is working on this as well as a whole another topic of discussion is the right to be forgotten. Um, the right yes. that you're not tracked on the internet, all, all of that. And that's a whole another huge. Uh, going back to my analogy around the information highway, uh, that's more, that's another whole discussion around like what, what kind of color the taillights on your vehicle have to be. Uh, that's a, another discussion to be had. Uh, and I'm sure we can spend another two hours on that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, obviously having your age verified because adults and children, everybody wanting to go on porn site would have age verification takes away a few minutes of your time. For an adult, for example, they would have, you know, people who like to watch porn would have to go through the system. And this is seen by some as, you know, um, an infringement of freedom of expression. Well, I'm sorry, this is where I agree with Penny Rankin. Protection of children should be um, more important than the fact that you lose 30 seconds of your life to be verified. Well, thank you all, and thanks, Saskia, for the question. Uh, I guess we have already crossed our scheduled time, and it just shows that what a great discussion we are having. So I would seek uh, permission from our panelists for maybe two more minutes to wrap up, so a quick wrap up. Uh, so it's been a lovely discussion, and before we go to the final takeaway message, I am just mentioning a couple of facts. So we have talked a lot about MindGeek, the company which is popularly known as Pornhub. 
So as a matter of fact, this company was founded by two Concordia graduates 20 years back. So, <laughs> so but uh, there's one part of the story, and that's something I should say ancient story. If we look back at recent times, we see a lot of other examples. I can talk about Rafaela Diaz Barsley. She is a Concordia student, and she has single-handedly founded a big campaign against Mind Geek, which has now become so bigger. So there are a lot of examples on different parts. On that note, I would ask our panelists to share maybe one or two sentences for the young audience who are seeing this in person online. We are in Concorda, we have a big group of youth watching this. So what will be your message to them from your arena, legislative, technical, social, how they can uh, contribute to this cause or how they can move ahead. So maybe we, we can start with Senator Miriel Dishan. Yes, and I had uh, Jerome who works with me and who's younger than me, help me on that part. Uh, so, um, you are the internet generation, we're talking to young people, all of the generations to come will also be internet generation, so you will get to shape, uh, to shape it for the decades to come, but there are fantastic possibilities on the internet, including as they relate to human sexuality, because we've talked about a lot about pornography, but there's other things that could be on the internet, like sex education use the internet to create meaningful and profound relationship it can be that too it doesn't have to be everybody you know hiding with their phones and not talking to each other and finally um i think the young people should fight against the destructive things that the internet has unleashed the internet did not invent fraud disinformation hate and porn but it put these things on steroids we, the old generation, I speak for myself, I'm 63, are trying to do something, but it is your generation that ultimately will have to determine how this extraordinary platform will contribute or not to the future of society. Thank you so much, Shen, uh, MP Pearson, any final message? Yeah, um, I guess just like, hey, thanks for being here, thanks for participating, Th this kind of thing, uh, we've, we've got to identify the problem. We've got to make the public aware of the problem and that there, uh, that there are solutions available. Um, uh, so speak up, speak out, uh, meet with your members of parliament, meet with your senators. Uh, yeah, hold, yeah, hold, a, we need you. We hold need an you. event uh, in a community that you're a part of. Uh, whether uh, for, So for, uh, for me, a lot of that is like your church community, get them engaged on this. Um, but you're, you're part of your community, you know a venue that's probably a place that this kind of a discussion uh, should and could take place. And, uh, and support initiatives like uh, S211 and, uh, and the CSAC. Um, uh, highlight that, write, 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 uh, write to your local paper or yep. po post the stuff that we have. And you can reach out to my office and we can put you on an email list that'll we send out an email about once a week as to the, or once a month, I mean, uh, as to this initiatives that uh, Senator Julie and I are working on, um, follow the follow the all party parliamentary group to fight human trafficking, modern day slavery, and see what they're up to. So yeah. Those are some fairly tangible uh, things. Be because if we in. don't have you, if we don't have the civil society, we cannot progress. You know, on on my bill, I know that about eighty percent of parents in the UK want age verification. We don't have such a poll here. We have many people interested. But the pressure that the civil society can exert is very, very important for us. Conversations more. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Karamian and Penny, uh, any last message, maybe briefly in a minute, please. Yeah. Well, I would just say that I fully support what um, has has been shared with us um, already from um, Arnold and, and Julie. But uh, yes, you are all going to be parents yourselves if you're not already and you probably recognize the harms much more than I did um, when I was raising my children and and the internet was just starting really at that point um, but th this is this is an issue everybody knows about child poverty and and issues around health care etc we need to also raise this issue up it it has huge implications for the future and um, so I appreciate that uh, Concordia has put together this panel, and I agree, we need to talk and talk and talk about this, this difficult subject and become aware of it. And also, I would invite everybody 
um, to really look at the Convention on the Rights of the Child, really have an understanding that children's rights are equal to all human rights, that kids do have a voice, and we need to um, listen to them. In fact, Canada would do a good job to to sign on to some other conventions that put children's voices um, to the forefront. So that's my last comment. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks many, Dr. Karimia. Last two sentences, you're the Z generation people. You're pretty much involved with the internet, vaccine. So even though it might be harmful, but also useful information you can capture from that. So be educated, be awareness, all the possible harmless that you might have and face in the future and educate, you know, your friends and your, you know, families, and that's going to help us. Um, so awareness on the um, kind of the ethical issue, problem issue, with it's raised on the, um, you know, age verification, how we can prevent that um, in terms of any problem that when it comes to age verification, either suicide or any a problem that may face an emotion health issue related to the age kids. So education, awareness, those are the key factor. And then your disease generation, the internet is the good resource that you can browse it and then access to those, lots of information. So again, a big thanks to our spirit panelists. Can we please clap for them for presenting us? So let's have a big clap for Senator Mivil Dishen, MP Pearson, Dr. Karamian, and Penny, so thanks for a wonderful conversation. It seems we could talk longer. We are already way ahead of time. So that just shows how intense and how connected we are to the cause. So let's make it this start. Let's keep talking about this thing and let's uh, help each other. And a big thanks to our audience present here in person also online. So hopefully we will chat more again. And I'm very grateful to the Fortispace team and uh, Jacqueline Douglas and others for helping with this wonderful arrangement. So with that note, we are clouding it for today and wishing all a very good day and a good time ahead. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, thank, uh, thank you, Aspar, for it's putting this panel to together. Me. And yeah. folks on Zoom, we're going to close up now. Thanks so much for joining us and for your engagement in the chat. We appreciate you so yeah. much. And of course, to our panelists, have a great day. It was great to meet you in this Thanks, way. Thanks, Thank you so much. Take care. And I, and I'm reminding everyone that we did live stream the, this uh, conversation to Concordia University's YouTube um, page on Fourth Space okay. specifically. So if you can look up Fourth Space Concordia University on YouTube, you'll find the conversation already there if you want to share it with your friends and colleagues. Thanks, everybody.